All right. Y'all are at the Lower Town Reading. It's a stiff crowd, you know. It's uh, you know, folks are kind of out here in this cold weather here in St. Paul. My name is Sean Webster. I'm from North Minneapolis, so I've come a little bit of a ways out here tonight and enjoy coming out to the Black Dog when I can out here in St. Paul. Um, and this is the Lower Town Reading Jam. So it's sponsored by the St. Paul Almanac. Some of y'all have been out here before to the Lower Town Reading. Who's been out here before to the Lower Town Reading? This is my first time, and I'm enjoying being able to be here tonight. So this is put on by the St. Paul Almanac and is sponsored by the St. Paul Foundation with support from the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. Uh, we have tonight some live art that's going to be going on. There'll be some poets that'll be coming up here to the stage. The live art is done by Takumba Aiken. Do y'all know, are y'all familiar with Takumba Aiken? <laughs> Phenomenal visual artist. Um, so, yeah, if y'all have not seen or had a chance to see his work, I think his work is placed up here, and he'll have something to show y'all later tonight. Um, as far as who's curating the event tonight, it is Shay, the Fonsei, and she is an avid artist, activist from Minneapolis. She uses her art to educate and inspire others to advocate and create change in their communities. She's been featured in a variety of publications, radio talk shows, and television stations such as the Asian American Press, Twin Cities Daily Planet, NPR, KFAI, AM 950, and Good Morning Minnesota, as well as SPNN, just to name a few. And I will have y'all welcome Shay to the stage. Yeah. Hey, you guys, thank you so much for coming. We have an awesome show for you tonight. I guess you guys are the only brave ones because I think the weather scared everybody. They said there's like uh, a windstorm or something coming. But we have an amazing lineup, and I'm excited. Um, the first performer that I'm going to uh, have the honor of bringing up is Kevin Yang. Kevin Yang is a Hmong American poet uh, from Minnesota here, and uh, he's a member of Speaker of the Sun. Um, and he's, as well as he's uh, presented, represented Minnesota at Brave New Voices Spoken Word Festival in 2011, as well as Hemline University Poetry Slam at College Union uh, in, in 2012, and will be representing again in 2014. Uh, I personally know Kevin through the Orange Crane Retreat this past summer, and, and this guy is amazing. Uh, kind of a hidden nugget in Minnesota, but... You guys are going to see his amazing talent today. So let's give Kevin a big round of applause. All right, what's up, everybody? All right, cool. Like Shay said, my name is Kevin Yang. And when I perform up here, it's, it's something that's really magical to myself because I consider myself very introverted. But like when I'm performing, I see it as a conversation between me and the audience. It's like I go home and I tell myself, yeah, I have a lot of friends now. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so yeah, but um, one of the biggest things that I love Slam is because when I'm out there, the audience is snapping. They are very much talking to me. But I can't talk to you if I don't know who you are. So I'll, I'll, I'd like, I love doing this thing where I'm going to count to three and I want all of you all to shout out your names really loud because you know who I am. But I want to know who you are too. All right. So all right. Three, two, one. Awesome, yeah, I, I heard a lot of names, all right? So, but I don't know y'all, so uh, I'm going to count down to three again, and I want y'all to shout out your favorite fruit or vegetable, all right? Three, two, one. It's like I'm, I've known y'all my whole life. <laughs> all right, cool. So this next poem is very much about being an introvert, and at the same time, you know, the theme, you know, is using our hands, and very much I use my hands when I'm up here to communicate and I'm not a very good communicator with my mouth sometimes so I use my body to do that so uh, this poem is called how to love your introvert <laughs> how to love your introvert one we introverts are not always the best at speaking what's on our minds, so we often have to resort to tactics that may seem obscure to your average extrovert. This may include subtle clearings of the throat, gentle hand gesturing, and numbers placed carefully into routine conversations 
where they normally do not belong to. Uh, to. <laughs> you may be asking yourself, how can I be sure that I'm speaking to an actual introvert and not someone simply masquerading as one? Well, worry no more. Here are a few telltale signs. If the person wraps their arms around your shoulders while they're introducing themselves to you for the first time, probably not an introvert. If the person uses the words nightclub and unwind in the same sentence, probably not an introvert. If the person attempts to engage in any conversation whatsoever about the weather and they're not from Minnesota, probably not an introvert. Three, to set the record straight, I do not hate people but I do get pretty tired of them sometimes. Let's pretend for a second that my desire to socialize can be equated to my desire to exercise. This means that catching a cup of coffee with a friend would be a lot like a quick jog around the block. Bar hopping with buddies would be like finishing a six minute mile and my senior prom was a little bit like running the Iron Man in the middle of August. You see, I don't hate talking to people any more than I hate a little bit of exercise, but you wouldn't challenge Usain Bolt to a race after winning five gold medals. Understand that I want to say, I can't hang out tonight. I just came back from a poetry jam. Maybe it's not because I hate you. Maybe it's because I'm tired. Four, there will be times when you will be uncomfortable in my silence, unsure of how I am feeling. Just because I do not wear my heart on my sleeve does not mean that it beats any softer than yours. Do not confuse the stillness of my lips with the rhythm of apathy. Do not confuse the sound of words rattling off 80 beats per minute with the music of an actual conversation. Just because I cannot commit the act of small talk does not mean I had huge things to say. Just because I find peace within myself does not mean I can't feel lonely does not mean I don't ever want to shout when I'm in the middle of a crowd does not mean that I could ever stop wanting to love so hard because five, we introverts are not always the best at speaking what's on our minds so we often have to resort to tactics that may seem obscure to your average extrovert. This may include subtle clearings of the throat, gentle hand gestures, and writing an entire poem just to say six, I love you. I love you more than quiet trips to the library. I love you more than canceling Friday night plans. Baby, I love you more than Tumblr. <laughs> but sometimes, you just take the words right out of my mouth. Thank you. Cool, all right, thank you very much. That's, it's a struggle, especially I go to like a lot of shows and some people are just super like mingling beforehand and I'm just sitting in my corner like I don't want to talk to anybody and then I leave right afterwards like the conflict of being an introvert and love being on stage too so <laughs> this next poem is something that is very dear to me um, I like to chart my own progress like whenever we learn about poems whenever we learn about poetry one of the very first things we learn how to do is to use a metaphor and a simile it's almost like the basics of poetry and I like to think a lot about what goes into a metaphor, what goes into a simile, right? You take this one thing that you kind of know what it is, right? But you, you know, you kind of don't. And you take this other thing that you kind of even don't know what it is even more, and then you like throw them together. Sometimes you throw in like or as, and all of a sudden you get left with this image, this beautiful image, and everything makes sense. And I think that's a very powerful testament of what I try to do with art, is to bring people who don't always belong together, people who don't always know the other person, and then in the end you're left with this beautiful experience and friendships and great things like that. So this poem, uh, this poem is called Like Me. Mrs. Judy, my fourth grade English teacher, once told me that a simile is a comparison between two different things using like or as, and with them, even you can create poetry. Sensing the confusion in my face, she held me gently by the wrist and told me that I was a simile, so that my hand looked like a turkey, thumb stretched out like a neck, four fingers fanned gracefully like feathers, and I believed her for a second. So I pressed my knuckles up against the plate like this was Thanksgiving dinner, laid my other hand on top like I was giving thanks, like I was thankful for once, and crossed my fingers into my fists, looked like biscuits, but where's the gravy? 
Nothing here looks like gravy. This can't be Thanksgiving dinner without gravy. So this hand is just like any other hand. This dinner is just like any other dinner in your poetry. Doesn't make much sense, Miss Judy. She snatched the cupcake off my desk and told me to give it back to me after I gave her a simile. Mrs. Judy, I want you to know that I've learned a lot about poetry in the 12 years since the fourth grade. One. Similes are like the sexiest literary devices invented since the preposition. I saw this girl on University Avenue and her dress looked like a Persian cloth quilt making love to itself across the Euphrates River. And she French kissed me right there in front of the construction workers. <laughs> Two, my hand does look a lot like a turkey, but I took a bite out of it and it tasted a lot more like chicken. Three. Valley girls are like the best poets in like the whole entire world because like every other sentence is like the most beautiful thing I've like ever heard in like my whole entire life, like totally, right? <laughs> Four, you see, I don't always like myself, but that's what the comparisons are for. I'll say that I look like my father, always so calm under pressure, a lot like me, but he's still kind of short, so I'll say that I look like my brother, three inches taller with a lot more confidence, but still yells too loudly, so I'll say that I speak like my mother, soft in languages I'm slowly forgetting with so much love, but you, all of you will say that I sound a lot like my poetry, but here's the thing. Poetry is like nothing I've ever done before, so excuse me if I continue making comparisons that I don't quite understand, like poetry is like sipping vodka at the gates of Mordor. Poetry is like planking at the top of Mount Everest. Poetry is like voting for Michelle Bachman. You see, we don't always understand the nonsense that drops out of our mouths. <laughs> But we still sound so beautiful even when we're next to words and people that we don't always belong with. Because Mrs. Judy, you, I, we are all a lot like similes. Now give me my cupcake. <laughs> like funny story, like, uh, one of my buddies offered to film that poem for me, and I filmed it, and I was like, this is amazing. I got to let Mrs. Judy know, because she was actually my fourth grade like, English teacher. She taught me how to write poetry. So I sent it to her. I'm like, Mrs. Judy, you're the greatest. You taught me how to write poetry. This poem's dedicated to you. And then she took like a week to reply. Maybe she thought I was like crazy with all my exclamation points or something. And then uh, she got back to me, and she was like, Kevin, that was amazing. This is why I do poetry. I asked my daughter to put it on flash drive so I could carry it around everywhere. But I have a question for you. Did I really take your cupcake? <laughs> I was like, no, nah, that was just a literary device. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so that was great. I love teachers. <laughs> All right. This last poem, uh, this last poem, we use our hands to love. And love is a beautiful thing. And it's still February, right? So uh, this is what this poem is about. It's called Passion Red. She makes love with the same hand that she paints with. The nails that stencil sunsets are the same tips that make her knees weak. You see, she doesn't tell me any of this, but by the way her fingers crack around paintbrushes, it ain't hard to tell. You see, she knows that beauty comes in more than seven colors, that it can't always be squeezed out of tubes, that sometimes it takes a little bit of touch. Now, I've never held hands with her, but I've seen her paintings. They aren't pretty, they aren't sexy, they are beautiful. I want her to teach me how to paint. We have an art class together on Tuesdays, but see, she has already exhausted the curriculum, knows the professor on a third name basis, so she was in the corner mixing oils while the rest of us had to li listen to lectures about Vincent Van Gogh. He once cut off his ear and presented it to his lover. Maybe I should do the same, because all I want to do is to hold her palms as she slips deep into the night and to watch her eyes glow big when she wakes up in the morning, and I don't need a pair of ears to do either. So one night, I'm walking in to finish a project that's been due for weeks, and of course, she's in her corner, doesn't leave the studio very often, and I'm trying my best to pretend that I've done this before, right? But somewhere between mixing magenta and teal, she splatters a rainbow. I splatter a rainbow over my sweater. She walks over, not saying a single word, rips a page from my notebook, uses it to mop the paint off my chest, not knowing that this was my favorite book of poems. She looks at my fingers, 
tells me that I have the digits of a writer, dull, but callous in all the right places, and then she holds on to my pinky and looks me directly in the eyes. Now, I do not believe in love at first sight, but see, we are not lovers. We are not false romantics. We are not poems written about our sadness. We are not raindrops trying to remember how soft the concrete can feel against the sole of our feet. I am not Ryan Gosling. <laughs> we are artists expressing ourselves in the only way we know possible. My arms wrap around her waist, trying to hold her steady. She is kissing me in ways that only the French know best. I look down and I laugh a little bit because my project has been crushed underneath the weight of our sweat. And she says, don't worry, just start over. She walks over to the tables turns the lights onto her body, throws a notebook into my chest, and tells me to draw like Leonardo did. And, and I ask her which one, because both drew bodies that they did not quite understand. <laughs> and then she tells me to write her a poem instead. So I take the pen, pretend that it is a paintbrush, and begin my poem in a way that could not have been any more honest, that it could not have been any more beautiful with a realization. She doesn't make love with the same hand that she paints with. Thank you very much for having me. All right, let's give, uh, oh, hey, Dante, how's it going? Um, let's give Kevin another warm Minnesota round of applause. Awesome. All right. Um, our next artist is Naomi Ko. Um, and Naomi, I met as well as the Orange Crane Retreat. Um, she's like, when I met her, I was like, that's my sister from another mother. And so like, we totally connected right away. Um, she's multidisciplinary uh, artist. She, mainly she acts, but she writes as well as an as awesome slam poet. Um, she was recently at Sundance uh, for her film, Dear White People. Um, and she does a number of amazing things and she can listen all and she writes for a Huffington Post. Um, so her credentials run on and on and I can go on all night, but I just wanna give her the time. So let's give her a warm round of applause, Naomi Ko. up <laughs> they say the pen is mightier than the sword screw the pen I am done with these pens I want to see someone use a sword because I am sick of these people cowering under the pen, writing hateful messages on the internet. What a fatty. No one will ever love her. All gays should die, and you should too. Lee's dad eats dogs. I am done with the pen. I want to see another person challenge with a sword. I want to see this person face to face face when they are so eager to slay me. I want them to look me in the eye as they draw their sword out of their sheath, fervent for my pain. Go ahead. Stab me with your sword. Stab me over and over again. Look me in the eyes as I bleed from your hand. But hear this. Your face, your face is now ingrained in iron. I will not forget your face. The pen is mightier than the sword. I see countless teenagers struggle with the hateful comments they get on their accounts. I see the hearts of aspiring artists ripped out of their chests on YouTube. I see what hands do in the privacy of one's home. Although no hand has wielded a sword, blood now drips onto the keyboard and drips down to the floor. I am done with this pen. I am over this pen. I don't want to see any more pens. Slay me with a sword. Watch me bleed. Watch me crumble to my knees. You don't agree with me. You disapprove of my violence? You call me a masochist, a violent woman. I am. 
but how can a pen be any less violent than a sword? When a child commits suicide from the scathing words that she has read over and over again and again, how has that not drawn blood? How has that pen not taken life? Give me a sword. I am done with these pens. Thank you. I'm a little taller than I think I am. I'm not going to awkwardly pick up that pen that I really want to. And you know what? I'm going to just pick up that pen. <laughs> All right. So unlike what Shay has said, I am actually... Darn it. Backtrack. So... I actually am not really a poet, so this is kind of a new thing for me, so this is kind of exciting, so bear with me as I am embarking this new uh, discipline, but all right, here we go. This is for all my millennials. I took an oath to never write a poem about love. This is a poem about love. I blame the internet for this poem. The internet has forced me to write a love poem. Love. Whatever, cliche and all. Why did these bloody physicists need to share data for knowledge, for understanding, for the betterment of our society? I blame you physicists for creating the stupid internet. I digress. The internet is trying to help me find love. Internet, I don't want love, I just want to date. Log on, pick your best pictures. If you are attached to someone, swipe right. If not, swipe left. And others will do the same to you. If there are gods and heavens, birth, both will swipe right and voila, love happens. Now, I don't want to be wooed by someone's index finger, I want to be wooed. I don't want a chubby finger struggling to message me on a two by five piece of glass and metal and rubber, rubber. Someone paint me a picture, sculpt me a figurine, read me a poem for Pete's sake. If you even have to shout, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks, you got me, I'm yours. Internet, have I not been a faithful servant? Have I not spent hours and hours browsing through your wonders? Have I not sacrificed enough for you? Have I not slept by your side, woken up to you in the morning, feeding your very existence? You don't want love. You want sex. You want drama. You want pretty blonde girls and handsome men. You want bets, cliches, last minute sprints, mischievous dogs, your token, non-romantically girlfriend of color. Wallflowers turn into clumsy heroines, turn into quirky princesses, misrepresented identities, kisses in the rain, reformed bad boys, New York writers with designer clothes, coffee spilled when colliding into the handsome man in the suit. That's all cool. No big deal. I can work with that. Can I just get a date? If I cannot have Shakespeare, Keats, Austin read to me, then please, someone swipe right. Swipe right. But you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear the Asian girl complain about love. You want to hear the part where she gets saved by a white man swooping in to catch the small butterfly in his arms. Fine then catch me in your arms. I'm falling. <laughs> Wait, why didn't you catch me? I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying to be real. Here it is. I'm bearing it all. Here's my love poem. Swipe right. having difficulties with the stand and microphone. I apologize. <laughs> All right. My hands are ugly. 
These are the ugliest hands in the world. My palm is small, my fingers short, covered in wrinkles with the most brittle nails. The skin is rough at the tips from where my thumbs pinch when I am anxious. The French shudder and mutter of how grotesque my hands are. My middle finger on my right hand has a bump from all the writing that I've done. A bump and a small indent. My hands are really ugly. I would like to blame my mother for my ugly hands. My mother has ugly hands too. They're coarse, they're wrinkly, the nail on her right middle finger is falling off. But my mother's face, that's not ugly, just her hands. My mother's hands are ugly from years of labor, from helping her parents around the house, taking care of her younger siblings. Her hands come from hard work. Her hands are ugly from working a factory job at, at night to take care of her two small daughters. Her hands are ugly from raising me, from wiping the food off my cheeks, the drool that drips down my chin, patching the scrapes on my knee, the extra hours she worked to send me to college and to send back home to her mother in Korea. Out of love, my mother's hands became ugly. My hands were always ugly from the start. There was no work. Instead of cooking meals and watching four younger siblings, I played. I swam for days upon days in the pool, feeling the cool water move with me until the water permanently churned my fingers into raisins. My hands are ugly from the blisters I got from haying, from the monkey bars at the park, and cuts I got from rollerblading. My hands never grew because they never needed to. They had never had to lift. They never had to provide. My hands remained small. But with each year, I distanced myself from my mother. With each fight, with each scoff, with each roll of my eyes, my hands became uglier. Every time I turned from a hug, flinch at my mother's touch, more wrinkles formed, punishing me for my mistreatment, punishing me for my selfishness. Though these hands are so ugly, they bear the marks of my vicious words. They bear the marks of an ungrateful daughter. I can repent. I cannot apologize. I can change. But my hands will forever be ugly. Thank you, you guys. Let's give Naomi another round of applause. All right. So if you guys haven't caught on yet, today's theme is like the title of our event, Can You Handle It? So you, if you've heard hands over and over, and I hope they've painted various pictures of how hands can, um, what, what hands um, symbolize. They can be of things that are built. Uh, you can use your hands to build things, to grow things, uh, to embrace things, but at the same time, hands can be used to destroy things or bring things down as well. So we're giving you a whole bunch of different perspective. Okay, so um, also, if, if you love what we put on today, um, it was made possible by the St. Paul Almanac. So anything you guys can spare, we're, we're, we're open to a donation. So I'll pass this around. Our next performer is Dante Collins. Um, and actually, Dante and I have not ever met in person. We've only been friends via Facebook, but it's legit, because everything is legit on Facebook, um, even relationships, right? Um, anyways, uh, but Dante, I've seen his work, and, 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 and it's amazing. And I'm like, I need to get this guy on this stage. And so I'm super excited to, um, to introduce Dante. And let me little, read you a little bit about his background. So Dante is a Chicago-born uh, slam po performance poet and author, known for his spoken word poetry. Uh, Collins is a Minnesota spoken word finalist and the co-founder and co-director of No Projection, a group of four brothers aiming to use spoken word as an inspirational tool. He began performing poetry at his elementary school, St. Peter Clever, at the age of 13. Winning the school's first talent show in 2009, he became a junior coach and judge for the future events. Moving on to high school, Collins continued performing and brought spoken word poetry with him. He then uh, helped his older brother, with the help of his older brother, Lamar, also a member of No Projection, uh, winning first place in the Say Word competition in 2012. In the mix of competing, Dante performs all of the 
over the Twin Cities at a variety of university theaters, uh, the Walker, including the Walker Arts Center, Orchestra Hall, uh, Pillsbury House Theater, Penumbra Theater, and University of Minnesota, um, as well as Oxford and St. Paul College. Uh, Collins has recently competed in the International Spoken Word Festival, uh, Brave New Voices, Voices, and is now concentrating on writing his first chapbook, Mice in the Basement of Heaven. Let's give uh, Dante Collins our big round of applause. Thank you. I'm like mesmerized by the sign language that's happening in the back, and I think it's beautiful. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll just get into it. Mother Moon, she is, fingernail clipped, draped from the tip of God's graceful hands, hanging loudly on that silent night, she is. Cookie cutter mother, she never was. Pine floor sweet smells did not streetlight her smiles, didn't steal her heart. That floor better be shining God's name before you eat. She is a Christmas of calls and carry gifts under 12 inch trees and trust that we don't peek or please for more. She is more, she is wax that leaked from buffers bending backs to polished floors. Her mother raised her on. She raised us on, raises us on. The love she has left, she is cut from her family portrait, pennied into ashtrays. Long before me, she was girl. Before mother, she was girl. Before divorced, she was girl. Dressed in dreams, dressed in the night that seemed so close to her. She was me, raised with nine brothers and sisters in a house too small to smile in, in a home too big to try to keep silence in with a mother trying her best to love all nine at once. She was a girl, dressed in dreams, as innocent as the communion that melted on her tongue. She was raised with pots and pans, hairpins, hot combs, and gardened hands as black as the skin of her Bible. Her mother, her Bible, her brothers, now rivals, her sisters, now silence. She sits in a home of bricks and bottled love ready to explode as light. She is building after burn. She is a wintered road of silk children, yet has no stretch marks to claim our name. She is our name, snatched from mouths not fit to speak. Its grace, its glory gave us the glory she graved to have. She is my mother. She is metal kitchen tables, missing lights from ceiling fans. Slow cooked greens give those bricks their smell on Sunday Junes. They seep from wounds, they bleed from wombs. She is her mother's cane. Her mother kissed God on the cheek before entering his gates. I know how I know the way my mother's lips formed a kiss to forgive her pain the night she grew her wings. Found her halo tangled in hairs of gray and gave her love to my mother to pour onto us. She is us, she is trying, I know. By the way she mops the floors locks the doors and keeps her kisses for special occasions like Christmas. That baked a generation of homemade hugs that can teach your heart to fall in love. She is love. Think words like life, like iridescent, like life, but dim, not dark, like moon, like mother, mother moon she is. Fingernail clipped, draped from the tip of God's graceful hands, hanging loudly on that silent night she is. Thank you. Um, yeah, this next piece isn't memorized, but um, I have been working on it for some time now, and it's after um, Karen Finney, and she has this piece called uh, The Newer Colossus, and she kind of personifies the Statue of Liberty um, and kind of speaks on uh, like political commentary that's happening at the time that she wrote it, and I wrote... Um, a piece after that called The Newest Colossus, The Statue of Liberty Rethinks Her Pose. And I'm still kind of working with it, so bear with me. I have been standing, toes numb and nipped by the give and take of salt, knees buckled and bruised a Wall Street gray. Right hand heavy, held hostage, blood drained and dry, holding a dying light, lips locked with a French kiss, all for you, America. The view is great. I see your sins ripple off the horizon like a peach sunset rotting from the outside in. 
I can smell the sweat from other women escape off your borrowed breath every time you buy one, get one free. I am the newest Colossus. I have aged here. You have turned my crisp copper into a sea sick green. I have seen the greed creep up like river weed off your shallow, sharpened shores. Tattooed into my ransom face reads, give me your poor. We are hiring your tired. We will strip them from their tongues and leave their language to be slaughtered. Teach them what it means to be free, but bought I have seen them, glistening like new money, shivering like broken glass against the water. Some come by boat, others by back, eyes dazzled with hope and me, their beacon burning in the black. I didn't know I would be a patriotic kite for a country who doesn't have all of its laws written quite right. I was young then, naive. Standing proudly at your gate like a prison guard, barely woman, watching the waves march in, carried out. Don't know about the war, of how all the black blood and white bullets make the soil so rich they didn't tell me about the pearls, how you plucked each one from the womb of Palestine and left their maroon bodies to dry around my neck. You have named me Liberty, Lady of the Free Land, given me a light to lure in your prey, placed open cuffs at the cusps of my feet, but I feel like your slave, America, your prop and your propaganda. I heard of those men who died trying to survive in your factories, passing themselves as mops for your strip malls, rags for your car wash, wearing star-spangled bandanas and humming your theme song, heard that boy died black and young. And you, you named the modern noose a gun, and you named the modern noose a gavel, and left your children asking simple questions like, why Z got free? And why he be the exception to that document written in calligraphy, I can feel them, their eyes, mosquito bullets biting their demands into my plaster, and they, they can smell my hypocrisy from the harbor. America, when did your tongue become calloused? When did you grow tombstones for hands? Thank you. Um, I am writing a collection of essays about my mother. Uh, and the, it's the the entitle the title project um, the entire project is called Talks with My Mother, and this what I'm going to share is part two of this project. Um. When the foam in the basement ceiling began falling, my mother went to get the nail gun and wood glue, then asked me to help her hold the funny feeling cotton sheets into place. This is your house too, she says with an incendiary tone. Don't you want it always looking nice? I, nine, and not knowing the difference between a pot and a pan, am standing on a circus wire step stool, nearly drowning in a juice-stained muscle shirt. My noodle arms strained and stretched overhead attempt to hold up a 1985 Selby Avenue creaking home. She orders me to control my jelly-like limbs as her accordion hand reaches to push in the first staple, pop. My hands flinch back from the crime scene. She, my mother, looks hard into my dizzy eyes, says, you ain't got nothing to be afraid of, boy, without moving her mouth. I quickly resume the position. <laughs> Life is going to make you flinch a lot if you don't man up soon, learn your left from your right, and to tie your own shoes. I want to rebuke her comment, say, I tied my shoes yesterday and that I write with my left hand, but don't. Instead, I press my tenuous tongue against the roof of my mouth and continue to hold up the ceiling. Pop! My eyes snap shut, but my hands stay glued to the panel. She doesn't notice. I want her eyes to congratulate my stillness. Want her to communicate something warm. She doesn't. I don't demand. I am calm. I can feel the blood leave my arms. I can feel my kneecaps melt. And you're going to be the man of your own house one day, she says, with a bent nail dangling from her crumpled lips. I grin, but do not reply. And some days are going to be harder than others. Sometimes your foundation will begin to rot beneath you. My arms, now numb, are frozen into place. Pop. And sometimes your children will have too many bruises, and you not have enough bandages for yourself. The blood and my toes become quicksand and fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah, and they might say you owe more on the mortgage than the house is worth, but before you give in, she says, before you sell your light to the dark or your house to some neon bank, go on and check your kitchen drawer. You might find some faith, an extra nail gun and some construction tape. Pop. Thank you.
I feel so short next to you guys. Wow, you guys, uh, wh how, what do you think so far? Are you guys enjoying yourself? Man, we got, we got a quiet crowd today. Do we need to stand up and do some jumping jacks, get energy? Because if you've ever been to a poetry slam, people are loud, and I don't want you guys loud, because I'm also an introvert, and so uh, I, I need your loudness to, to have that energy. Um, so, um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I hope I... The three performers gone before me, they're amazing. I, I feel so um, so wonderful just being in their presence. Um, so we're, I'm gonna wrap up the night. Um, thank you so much for bring, coming out and supporting us and showing your love in this really cold weather. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, ooh. Okay. Um, so the uh, I'll, I'll perform two pieces for you, and they're actually from my book. Um, if you like what you hear, I have uh, some copies that if you want to purchase them, even if you don't have money and you just want some, I can give it to you because I just have that kind of love. Um, I published this as part of the Legacy Fellowship in 2012, and it really embraces um, issues of class, gender, and race, um, and personal experience of my life. Um, so, and my name is Che Dumpusai, um, and I'm Lao Kamai, and uh, I like to use some of my language. So, in, in Laos, we say Sabaidi, which means hi. So, can I get a Sabaidi from you guys? Sabaidi, awesome. Okay, so the piece that I'm going to perform for you um, is from my experience growing up in the refugee camp. Um, after you guys hear this, uh, you might think differently of me, but I hope we can still be friends. <laughs> it's a little nasty, but I hope you guys enjoy it. It's called uh, Professional Divers. I was three, so was Noi. Ty and Thee were just over one. We were four starving kids living in the refugee camps. Every day we snuck outside of our tin roof, dirt floors, empty rice bowls, stomachs filled with air. We stood for hours outside of a makeshift theater. People were laughing inside, eating food, feeling full. I wonder what that feels like. The sun had set. It was getting late. The movie was almost over. Then the owner will come out. He'll throw away the spoils. The dumpsters will be full of treasures. Rotten mangoes, bruised bananas, sour rambutans. Mmm, those were my favorite. It didn't matter that the maggots got to them first. See, hunger hurts too much to care. We became professional divers at a young age. We got better each time. We had it all planned out. That was how we were going to survive. Then one night, I thought I heard someone crying. See, your ears start to play tricks on you when you never get enough to eat. Just when we were about to dive in, something caught hold of my shirt. I turned around, and it was my mother. For a woman who could never hurt a hair on my head, her hand sure came down pretty hard on my back. I tried to make out the words between her crying and beating. It sounded something like, I'm so sorry. See, I forgave her that night, but she never forgave herself. Something dies inside of a woman when she has no way to feed her children. Thank you. Can we still be friends? <laughs> Even though I ate out of a dumpster, it's cool. Um, oh, OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, we gotta survive, right? Okay. Um, the last piece is dedicated to my grandma. Um, I remember a conversation with her. She has so much wisdom, and she shares with me. Um, and and I dedicate this piece to her. It's called "What Is Fair." Um, it gave me insight when I went through a hard time in my life. I remember grandmother tell me once, most things in life are competitive, but you cannot race destiny. Some people are just born luckier than others. Tracing the palm of my hand, trying to find a line of fortune, my efforts go in vain. From the day I was born, my life has been a hardship sailing on the rocky waters of fate. Every grain of rice has fallen to my stomach, has grew from the sweat of my brow and the callus on my hands. Out of breath, trying to catch a break, 
I cast my nets upon a sea of stars and still come up empty. Has heaven forgotten me? Was I overlooked? When will it be my turn? If justice is blind, mercy must be tender. Then tell me what is fair. Thank you. So, Dante, did you want to say some closing words? Or, oh, oh, Sean, yeah, sorry. Sean, did you want to say some closing words? Oh, okay. So thank you so much, you guys, for coming out. Feel free to come up and mingle with our artists. Oh, and uh, Takumba, he took pictures, uh, he drew pictures of, <laughs> with, his, with his eyes, yes, and his hands. Yeah. <laughs>